We now turn from our empirical discussion to a theoretical discussion of how an exhaustible resource is priced. And your first reaction should probably be that exhaustible resources would be priced in the same way that that all other resources are. So recalling what we did in the early part of the semester, if we have the quantity of an exhaustible resource extracted at a particular date, I'll use the T subscript, and we have the profit that the firm earns at that date, let's suppose that the relationship looks like this, then since firms are profit maximizing, we would suppose that the firm produced at this point, whoops, let me get that back, and therefore at this level, maybe this is, oh, I don't know, maybe it's uh, 15 tons per year. But this theory isn't going to work for exhaustible resources because the firm can't produce 15 tons per year forever because at some point it's going to run out. So that's the first point to understand that the simple theory we had in the beginning part of the semester that the firm simply maximizes profit at every moment can't work for exhaustible resources for every date. It can work for some dates but it can't work forever because at some point you're going to run out. So, how is the firm going to extract resources? Again, the firm has a choice. It can pick whatever Q it wants as long as the sum of the Q over time is less than or equal to the total amount of resource that exists. Well, the simplest, so since you know that the program which pulls out 15 15, 15, 15 forever is not feasible. The simplest next guess is that what the firm does is to pull out 15 tons of resource for as long as it can and then go to zero. So, for instance, if the total stock of the resource was 60 tons, then it could pull out 15 for four years, but then it'd have to go to zero from that point on. So that's certainly, this, uh, th this path is certainly feasible if the original stock were 60 tons. I want to argue, though, that this isn't the right answer either to what the firm is going to choose to do, and it's not going to constitute a competitive equilibrium. So to explain that, think about what happens between the last date at which it extracts and the first date at which it's run out of material and so extraction is zero. Now we are going to assume that the industry is in competitive equilibrium. And equilibrium means quantity demanded equal quantity supplied at every date. So let's think about the demand curve. We have price at a particular date, quantity at a particular date, and demand curves are usually downward sloping. Actually, I'm going to draw the demand curve like this. Just before exhaustion, we have a quantity of 15 and uh, its corresponding price. Maybe that's, I don't know, $3. Just after that, the resource is exhausted, so we move to a quantity of zero, and this price, maybe that's a price of, I don't know, seven dollars. So in terms of time versus price, 
we had a price of three dollars. And this is date. I mean, this is time one, time two, time three, time four, times five. So at time four, we had a price of three dollars. And at time five, we have a price of seven dollars. And basically what happens is before time four the price is steady at three and then after time five you, you go up to a steady price of seven. So you have a jump up in price between time four and time five and that's caused by quantity shifting down from 15 to zero. So the only way that you can have quantity shifting down from 15 to 0 and still be on the demand curve is have price shifting up. In other words, you want to convince consumers in time period 5 not to buy anything. How can you convince consumers in time period 5 not to buy anything when before in time period 4 they were happily buying stuff at three dollars a unit they were buying 15 units well you have to increase the price on the consumers so if you increase the price on the consumers from three to seven they're going to decide ah oh, that's too expensive I'm not going to buy any more and that's how you can get quantity go to go to zero in time period five by having price increase so this is what you need to get this is this is what you would have to have in order to be able to stay on the demand curve but this doesn't make sense from a supply perspective. Assume that the firms are competitive. That means they take prices as given. In the dynamic context in which we're working here, that means they take all future prices as given. They have a crystal ball, they can see all future prices, and they think they don't affect the future prices at all. Now, suppose you're a firm, and you have a crystal ball, and this is what you see you see all future prices and you're trying to decide when to produce what you see that between time periods four and five the price is going to jump quite a bit are you going to plan on running out of your resource just before time period five I claim that would be a pretty bad plan if you know and by assumption you do that the price at time period 5 is going to go up to $7 a unit, you wouldn't want to have zero amount of quantity in the ground at that time. You'd want to conserve some of the resource so that was a, it was available at time 5 when the price went up a lot. And so the point is that the competitive firm seeing this future for prices is not going to respond in this way. It's not going to respond by saying, oh, we're going to plan on running out just before the price becomes a really great price. Instead, they're, they're not going to do this. They're going to leave some of their resource available unmined until time five and that means that this is not a competitive equilibrium in other words uh, what we did was we ass we made this assumption for quantity used the demand curve or combined that with the demand curve to conclude that this is the way the price would have to behave but then we showed that if price behaved this way then quantity would not behave this way and so you have a contradiction which means that you don't have a competitive equilibrium so this plan is not feasible and what we've just shown is that this next plan is not a competitive equilibrium it's not a competitive perfect foresight equilibrium. S 
so what does happen? What, what, what is the economic theory of exhaustible resource pricing? If it's you can't do 15 forever, and it's not a competitive equilibrium to do 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, and then all zeros. Well, the answer turns out to be something called the hoteling rule. That's what this video is called. And the hoteling rule actually mathematically comes to the same place as the equation that we studied back in chapter 15 when we were talking about the fisheries and dynamic private property. And just to recall, we argued that the equilibrium in a fishery occurs when the biological growth rate plus the percent increase in marginal profit, that's technically the, the correct thing, not price at marginal profit, was equal to the discount rate. And it turns out that a variation of this formula is also valid for pricing exhaustible resources. The variation is actually quite simple. The first term is the biological growth rate. Or maybe I should say the first term was the biological growth rate. Of course, for exhaustible resources, you're not talking about biology. There is no growth rate. There is no growth rate except in geologic time, which we're not, which we're not interested in. So the first term in, in, in an exhaustible resource context goes to zero. That's the only change we have to make. The rest of the equation turns out to hold. In other words, the equilibrium is characterized by a percent increase in marginal profit equaling the discount rate. And that's the hoteling rule. In other words, the hoteling rule says that the percent increase in marginal profit is equal to the discount rate or sometimes the interest rate. So another way of putting it is that marginal profit rises at the rate of interest. So that's another way of phrasing the hoteling rule, and it's another way of phrasing this, this mathematical equation. I'm going to explain more about the hoteling rule and this result in the next video.